Welcome everyone to the 37th Fireside Chat uh, here with Tom Campbell. Today we have Ron Cardillo as one of our guests. He's a member of the Fireside Chat for a while. He's developed a new app and he'd like to tell you about it. It's something quite extraordinary. Ron? Hi everybody. So thanks Don. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on the chat. And hello everybody. Hi Tom. So the name of the app is called Within Us. Um, it's currently under development and we're looking to have a beta launch by November uh, 10th and launch it to the App Store by uh, January 8th, I believe. The app, uh, basically the gist of it, is a way for people to share uh, how they overcame struggles in their life um, anonymously through the means of video and audio. So uh, some of the categories that we've created that people can post content in would be something like death, um, you know, just go straight to the worst one. And then you have things like uh, breakup, family. You have things pertaining to perhaps your job or uh, uh, one category is called actually good juju if you just want to post some positive comments. And then uh, so you have all these different categories. The cool thing about the app is there's no way for people to troll you. Um, kind of built the feature in where there's no likes, there's no followers, there's no friends. It's just creating um, an environment, a safe environment, um, and we're doing the best. And Tom has been in instrumental in helping this come to fruition, not only from the decade of me following him and all the influence he's had, um, but actually in advising the direction of where this app should go and how we can get the most reach to the, to the masses. Um, I really wanted to be able to and actually the idea, it's kind of funny, the idea came to me during a meditation. And I don't take any credit for it. Um, it was just kind of plopped in my lap and I'm just having the responsibility of hopefully getting out there to as many people as I can. It will be free. Um, if you want to learn more information about it, you can go to www.withinusapp.com. Um, there's a kind of a cool video that we produce that's out and float about the web on, on Facebook. And um, we're going to do an abridged video a shorter one because the one that we have is a little bit long uh, for, and that should be released tomorrow actually and then um, just check on the Facebook page for updates and the website for updates but I think um, people will like it and we're creating some cool features and it's nothing else is out there that's like it we've done some digging and I think it's going to be pretty unique and hopefully help a lot of people all right, thank you, Ron. We look forward to that. And I'll be posting a link to the new video on the Fireside Chat in the description area. Today we have two very uh, pleasantly, um, Bill O'Brien from Ireland. And if, Bill, you would like to start off with your question, you're welcome. Well, thank you, Donna. Hi, Tom. Hi, folks. Um, my question is, um, OK. The best way to distinguish between a fanciful compulsion choice and a, a useful driven choice. And uh, the question came to me uh, the other day, we were discussing taking a year off and traveling uh, around to different parts of the world, uh, you know, gain experience and grow and also to help prevent getting into a, a rut, kind of that routine, uh, routine rut. Um, the ideas come up a lot of times over over the years, and there's always been an excuse or a or a or a but, and a, or whatever that causes us to leave it aside and, and slip back into the same old, uh, you know, into the daily routine. What's a good way to determine if it's a if it's a useful like a a, a decision that's good or a, a rather than just you know a compulsion, which is pretty much how most of uh, I would say most of my choices are made. You know, uh, so thank you, um, Bill. You know, it's hard to me for me to give you a a way of deciding because the decision needs to turn on the intent that you have. Uh, you know, for this trip, what's really the motivation down at the core of it? Um, is it a uh, is it a you know, a vacation? Uh, is it a um, you know, just getting out to see other things, like you say, getting out of the getting out of the rut. Is it uh, escaping the, you know, the the rut that uh, you might be in? So there's lots of 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 different ways that one might come to this sort of question, and you have to also look at all the people that would be going with you and what their ideas were. 
Um, you know, you're taking your kids, then how do they feel about that? And, you know, where are they in their, in their life? Is it, are they at a, an age that they can get a lot of value out of that or not? So that would depend on your kids and their interests and whether or not you think they could really gain from it. And that's a hard one because kids don't always know what it is that they, you know, would like to do. And they certainly don't always know what would be good for them to do. And of course, your your wife or significant other or whoever else might be going with you on this trip. So everyone pretty much has to be up for it. If it's going to be a long trip of two years, you have to either be independently wealthy, you know, with a you know a, a, a few million dollars in the bank so that you can pay all your expenses for two years, or if you're like most of us then you have to have a plan for staying alive, finding shelter and food, you know, for two years uh, while you do this traveling. And that could get, uh, you know, that, that could provide some serious hardship. And are your children at an age that serious hardship, like that would be something they would learn from and something that they could, uh, you know, work with or not? Would it, would it turn into a nightmare, you see? So you can't foresee what might happen in a couple of years. I guess you could always have enough cash held back in the in the secret place so that if you had to quit and go home in a hurry, then you could do that. You'd have the funds for that. But uh, if, if not, you could find yourself stuck in some unpleasant situations. So I think it would, you know, it could be a great thing. I took all my kids out of school and we spent one month, not two years, but one month just driving around the country, seeing sights and, and, uh, uh, exploring what was out there to explore. And it turned out to be wonderful. Uh, kids got a lot out of it. Uh, the whole family, uh, came together and we're a lot closer. We spent an awful lot of time very close to each other, you know, inside cars and, inside tents and cabins and it worked out very very well uh, but one month is a lot different than two years there's a whole different set of uh, s strategies that would need to happen like that so it could be really great it could be something that everybody looks back on the rest of their life and thinks wow that was really amazing or it could be something really horrible that everybody looks back on <laughs> in years and says wow that was crazy Oh, yeah. Remember that time the police had us all in jail because, uh, you know, we couldn't find our papers because somebody stole all of our backpacks. And, uh, you know, it could it could be really uh, tough as well. And depending on your kids and how tough they are and how resilient they are and at what ages they are, you know, that, uh, you know, three weeks in, in a Mexican jail or whatever, you know, could could be awful or it could be fun. You know, you never, you never know. So it, it just depends on why you're doing it and how everybody else feels about it and why they're doing it. Uh, but if everybody's gung ho and you can somehow f figure out how to pay for it, then uh, it could be a, a marvelous, a marvelous trip. And of course, then if you have a job that you're leaving to do this, you know, is that job going to wait for you when you get back or are you going to get back and now be, uh, you know, unemployed and, and, uh, having a problem and are, is where you live in a recession right now where finding jobs is a really hard thing to do and you need to hang on to the one you have until times are better or there's plenty of jobs to be found whenever anybody wants one. So there's just lots of decisions that have to go in. It's not a simple thing like, oh yeah, Blast out of the rut. That's a good thing to do. You know, maybe, maybe not. Awful lot of questions need to be thought about in a in the context of you and everybody that's going on this trip need to think about it together. You know, need to uh, not just you decide whether it'd be a good thing to do, but everybody needs to decide and you need to go over the possible hardships and difficulties and how you'd earn your way, you know, around the world and in, in, uh, you know, in two years, et cetera. So. If everybody's up for it and you got a plan to execute it without, uh, you know, in undue uh, pain and agony, then it sounds like fun. Yeah. Thanks, Tom. That's, uh, that's, that's an advice. 
I can, the two is meant to be one, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it was it's an idea's come and gone, and it was, but it was also about ideas about compulsions rather than uh, you know what would be a solid plan or just random compulsions driving uh, mm -hmm. driving. My yeah, choices. well, often we have these random compulsions driving choices because our ego would like to escape, or you know we'd uh, we'd like to be. Um, you know, uh, free to just roam around and do whatever we wanted for a while. Those are things that probably everybody feels. But do you pack it all up and you know and go or not? It's a different decision. So you know, it's hard to say where those ideas are coming from. And only you, inside your own mind, and everybody else that might be involved inside their heads, can actually determine what the intent is. Is the intent not such a good one, like wanting to escape and do something more fun uh, rather than stay home and, you know, work for a living? Or is the intent, um, you know, something of uh, expanding horizons and willing to take whatever comes in order to do that? So it depends. You know, it could go either way. I don't think there's any way that you can look at it and apply some kind of formula and say, oh, this is this one's a good idea and that was not. It's just that individuals have to discover where their bottom line intent is and why they're why they're doing it thank you um i will ask a question for huda today her question is uh know thyself that's her subject who am i is a recurring question in my life as i'm sure in the lives of many my left brain identified three levels to know thyself. Me as a specific human being with a purpose and inclinations living on planet Earth. Um, on a second level, sense something older, calmer, wiser, and almost genderless. And finally, on the last level, a tiny whisper of myself as all. In the search for who we truly are, what levels, what levels are we able to truly uncover? Do you know yourself as Tom with a specific purpose and inclinations for this one lifetime? As your IUOC in all lifetimes and as all, all at once? Can you tell us a little bit about these levels and as knowing ourselves as all within our reach in our lifetimes? What does know thyself really mean? Yes, so those three levels do make a lot of sense. Those are good, uh, good descriptions. And you can uh, live on all of them. You can experience all of those levels. It's generally a good idea to explore all of those levels, but at the same time, don't get trapped in any of them. Okay? You can get too enamored of a particular level and what's going on and in any one of those three. You can spend, uh, you know, many, many hours working on past lives or many, many hours just working on um, you know, what you're doing uh, daily in this, uh, in this PMR. And you can spend too much time in that, uh, that last level of being one with all there is. Uh, all of them can become traps, but all of them should be something that you strive to, to, to have contact with because it's all a part of you and who you are and what you are. And to leave any of them out is to really miss something important. So they're, they're different, um, different value, I guess, to, to each one of them. The, the living here on the planet Earth, that's where you're making most of your choices. That's where the rubber meets the road and, and you're growing up. You wouldn't want to uh, pass that one up. That is kind of the key reason you're here is to do that. The second level, understanding uh, who you are in a bigger picture. Um, you as is the, is the individual unit of uh, consciousness. You as the uh, immortal soul. That's another part of you. And that should be something that you experience as well. Uh, and when I say experience, I, I don't mean think about or just intellectually. But I mean experience. Be in that space where you experience that. And the last one is typically one that we um, we hear about uh, sometimes with NDEs or people who are experienced meditators where they become one with all that is. They go to the light, they get enveloped by it, they feel that they are integrated with everything everywhere. They, they are one with all that is 
and at the same time they feel this encompassing love that uh, is just overwhelmingly beautiful and that's that last level and that's something that everybody can experience and should experience you often have to be a at least a, a mediocre meditator to get there i wouldn't suggest anybody go out have a near death experience but just a a, a mediocre uh, ability to meditate can get you to that point if you have a strong intent to make that connection a strong question about how, what does that feel like what is that you know what is that i would like to experience this the system i'd like to experience the larger consciousness system and what it's made of that sort of thing and then you can you can have that if you if you have an intent for it so all of those all of those levels are required if you really know yourself any one of them's missing then you don't quite know yourself but the one that is most critical to us i guess in the little picture would be the first level you know we're here to make choices and that's the way we evolve or de-evolve by the quality of those choices the other two basically give us a bigger picture give us perspective give give us a sense of who we really are at a at a a level that's much deeper than just the one that's making choices here in this virtual reality so yeah very very good question uh huda and uh you have uh uh, this there's another question we're going to have today i believe by eric that touches on the on very much the same thing so these are uh, all important hana has a second question um and this is a, a very good one on how to unify different religions and cultures this question is about islam muslims believe the quran to have been directed by god because a it contains information about the world unknown to man at the time of its conception including predicting events and prophecies and B it is said to be a mathematical miracle that couldn't have been put together without the help of a computer for instance the sum letters of chapters is a multiple of 19 a number hard to multiply among other mysteries like graphs and such These miracles along with the books believed mathematical perfection is said to have kept it unchanged over the years and this believed perfection has been the justification for an extra dose of fascination and violence compared to other religions so what is the rational explanation for these occurrences who wrote the book how did they know what they knew could you query the past database and find out you might have guessed that the intent of my ego is to rationalize with irrationality which is itself irrational so could you maybe most importantly advise us the attitude to take in general to create a bridge of unification between religions and cultures is there anything we can do to help alleviate the guilt caused by religious beliefs besides giving our loved ones the safe loving space to find it on their own and how can we rise above the impulse of getting annoyed at their pressure to join their club well there was at least 6 or 7 maybe 8 questions there um let me do the one that was most important toward the end and that is how do we deal with other people's beliefs uh particularly if these are people that are you know family members of yours or in somebody that you need to interact with in a in a deep and meaningful way we should always let other people be who they are we cannot and should not instruct other people about how they should be what they should think the right beliefs which of course would be our beliefs uh, that is not functional trying to uh, you know instruct others so we need to first let other people just be who they are and accept that and not feel like there's um you know we have to fix something or we have to set them straight or we have to get them to like our ideas or any such thing just accept that is the way they are and of course you can engage them in a discussion as long as it's polite and friendly but as soon as it turns 
not so productive, which often it does if you're talking about you know beliefs, then let it alone. Keep it gentle and keep it positive and don't try to, you know, don't push it. So how do you, how do you uh, get rid of the guilt that goes, you know, with, uh, with religion? Well, the guilt's there because religions are often based on fear. Fear is a, you know, fear is a tool by which people can be not only recruited, but then held as part of the faithful. So many religions are very fear-based. If you do not follow this religion, terrible things will happen to you. If you do not follow this religion, you will be an outcast and so on. It's just fear. Fear-mongering uh, is, a, is just common in, in most religions. And the way to rise out of that is just to let go of that fear, not accept that fear. Don't, uh, don't buy into it. And if other people uh, tell you those things about the awful things that will happen to you because of the way you think, then let them believe that. But you don't have to let that upset you. Again, let them be them rather than uh, feeling like you somehow have to straighten it out and get them to agree with you or you to agree with them. Just let them be. Okay, now the earlier questions of uh, you know who wrote the book and how did they know what they knew? Sort of thing. Well, you know, for for well, I don't know how far back, uh, you know, four thousand BC or whatever. We can go back a long time and find that there are people who have been explorers of inner space. Humans have always had their their inner space to explore. It takes a lot of technology to explore outer space, but it doesn't take anything but a will and a and a uh, you know a desire to uh, find truth to explore inner space. So explorers of inner space have been around forever for a very long time. You know how is it that the Buddha knew that this was a virtual reality? Well, he didn't call it a virtual reality because that wasn't a concept or a word that existed then. But he said this physical reality is an illusion. That's pretty close to calling it a virtual reality. Well, how did he know that? You see. It's because he explored inner space. And when you explore inner space, you can find answers to the big questions. You can get that information. It's available there with an intent and with, if you have integrity and you are, you are asking these questions without ego or without fear, you can get some very good answers. So it's a, it's a combination between the larger consciousness system providing information and Muhammad or Buddha or Christ, you know, collecting that information from exploring their own inner consciousness and the larger reality and then, you know, writing it down. But when it comes to actually writing it down, then it had to be a physical hand to write it down. Manuscripts didn't drop out of the air and fall on the ground. Somebody, some avatar had to write it all down. And when an avatar is involved, then there is limitations on how that avatar can, can um, interpret the information they have. So we seldom get things without some, some twists and bumps in them due to the interpretation of the individual. Individuals can only interpret based on their own experience on what they, what they know, only can, can communicate based on the words that are available to them to communicate and the concepts that are available to them. So it's not that unusual for people to study inner space for a lifetime and come to these very similar profound understandings and to be able to often uh, make predictions about how the world will work, how it will go. And it's not that they just have these predictions that, um, you know, that they're, that that's, it's kind of magic that they do that. Those predictions are based on very fundamental ideas and principles. That's not too hard to see logically how they're going to work out given the way the world is and given the way 
evolution works, you can often come to some pretty, you know, good predictions about what, you know, is what is going to happen. Like I, you know, for example, I tell people that one day this, this uh, planet will be inhabited by a, by a, a people that are all one family that we will be caring for each other. There will be lots of love. Entropy will be low, and it will be about other, not about self. And you can look around and say, well, it doesn't look like that's going to come true anytime soon because it's just the opposite out there now. But I can say that and make that prediction because that is the direction that evolution is taking us. And I know that evolution is slow, but it is relentless. That you may have, you know, you may have backsliding. It may take one step forward and two steps backward, but eventually evolution will have its way because that is the efficient, the optimal solution. That's how evolution works. Those solutions that are optimal eventually rise to the top, and those that don't work eventually self-destruct. So However long that might take, we will get there one day because that's where evolution will take us. So you see, that's that's not such a brilliant uh, prediction. It's just looking at the nature of reality and how it works and extrapolating a logical conclusion. So I think that is generally, uh, you know, the way uh, these things work. With big picture knowledge, often think, oftentimes things that, seem mysterious, begin to look clearer. So I don't think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's magic. Uh, you know, the book was written by an avatar. Avatar was being played by a consciousness, and that consciousness was in tune with the bigger picture. That's the sort of thing that, that, typically, uh, that typically happens. So the way you uh, get along and build bridges is mainly by keeping your mouth shut and not arguing and not being, uh, you know, not having your ego get get uh, into a into an ego fight with some other ego. So it's it's when you let go of that fear, then you don't have a need to be right. You don't have a need to have other people agree with you. You don't even have a need for people to like you. You're okay with things just the way they are because you're confident that you're doing the right thing, and that's a, that's good enough. That other people disagree with you, well, that's that's them. Let them be on their path. All right, thank you, Tom. Ahuda has another question. It's more of a comment on the Primal Man, Primal Woman book that you're writing. Um, and it's something that you might be able to comment on. It's very well written, so I would like to read it all. It's a, it's a little bit of a long paragraph, but I'd like to read it all because I think it's important. Um, Huda says, I read your PDF on your future book about gender, primal man, primal woman, and has been a huge help to me. I feel it is urgent and important information. Thank you so much for writing it. In it you say, because we live now in a low consciousness, male-dominated environment, women's true value is undermined. Women don't really know themselves, don't know what it is to be female yet. You encourage women to start a conversation about what truly is of value to them beyond the male definition of life and success. I feel that with all of that, and I feel the feminine aspect in both men and women is heavily undermined. Men can't cry, and women are often viewed as too sensitive and practical and insane if they dare to let their feelings out. Having watched my own mother's depression, feeling of failure to fit into society, and anger at men hamper her will to live, take her to the grave, and having been around beautiful young girls in my surroundings who have felt so misunderstood that they have taken their own lives, I take this subject to heart. You encourage women to ask themselves what they would need to be fulfilled and whole. I would like to take this opportunity to answer this question for myself in the hope that it may help other women and even encourage them to speak up as well. In order to feel whole, I personally would need first and foremost the courage to be as nurturing and caring as my heart guides me to. 
in spite of judgment, to trust my own guidance in spite of the status quo. I would also need the wisdom, wisdom to know I am not weak and dependent on men for my physical and emotional safety. Moreover, I would need to honor and release my feelings of rage, abandonment, and loneliness in order to know true forgiveness and freedom. These depend only on me. I hope to feel whole no matter what the externals are in this world or whatever is thrown at me. But if my environment wishes to assist me and other women in our efforts, our feelings must cease to be discounted and our desire to nurture things must be recognized, valued, and integrated in society. If society wishes to assist us, then we would have caring brothers helping us with the outside world, gentle sisters assisting us in the nurturing of the human tribe, and elders showering us with all their wisdom instead of being thrown into elderly homes like unproductive parts of society. If society wishes to assist us, it would re rethink the definition of productivity so it serves the needs of the entire human tribe and not only of the 2% in harmony and respect of the environment and our ecosystem. These are the wishes that would increase my opportunities to do my heartfelt job of wanting to nurture and care for us all. They are valid. Until women can do their job, I feel our children would continue to turn into self-centered Instagram zombies and society will continue to walk on its head. We want to help remind us all that life is worth living beyond our paychecks and TV dinners. If that is of value to anybody out there, we would gratefully welcome this support. As I write this, I fear being this open or writing this much. Even here, I fear criticism of my emotions. My hope, Tom, is that you will help me and hopefully other women understand what the true problem is so we may gain some confidence in that which we feel down deep. Very well written. And uh, I would say with uh, uh, all of it, I, I agree with it uh, very strongly. Uh, I'd like to comment on, a, on, a, on a, one of the statements made, and that is one of the things that we need to change uh, in, our, in our culture. Uh, you said, uh, I need the wisdom to know I am not weak and dependent on men for my physical and emotional safety. That is a, that's a key challenge for us. You see, we as a species evolved for 150,000 years when there was no security. Times were really, really hard. You didn't, uh, you know, the lifespan was about 35 years. It's about all people lived. It was a very tough thing. And our species learned to cope with this by uh, specializing. Men specialized in protection and in gathering, uh, well, I shouldn't say gathering, but in uh, you know, producing uh, the necessities of life, you know, the shelter and the food. And it, a lot of that was they were the, the guardians, they were the warriors, they were the ones that you had to keep the ladies safe. The reason for that is the ladies were having babies, lots of babies. There was no birth control. There was no even sense of where the babies came from, probably, for a long time. And women were pregnant probably every year and a half or so. So they had multiple children to feed. And they didn't buy, uh, you know, formula to put in a bottle, you know, at the neighborhood store. You know, they had to feed those children from their own bodies. And they had to take care of those children. And that was a full-time job. Well, that became part of our success story as humans because everybody didn't do everything. We specialized. Women specialized in the, in the uh, having and feeding and rearing of children. Men specialized in the protection and the, pro and the provisioning of the women. That put women in a position of staying home in the cave, taking care of kids while the men went out and dealt with the saber-toothed tigers and with the other tribes that would like to take their stuff. So we have that as part of our instincts, that women are dependent on men for their physical and emotional safety. 
because that's the way it was all this time that we were evolving and creating our instincts. So we still have that feeling, but we don't have roaming bands of, uh, you know, of saber tooth tigers. And we don't have, you know, the, the idea that you can't get out of your cave without being, uh, uh, hurt. See, women were very valuable in that time. They were the most valuable thing around. Men were expendable. Women were not. The only way to succeed was to have numbers. If you had numbers, more people, then you were powerful and you could keep others from overrunning you, whether those were critters or other humans. So keeping those women and those babies alive and healthy was the number one job. And when in those days, when one group of people overran or conquered another group of people, they basically would kill all of the men from puberty up and take all the women, the women to join in with their tribe. So those women were valuable. They produced babies. Babies produced safety. And that uh, was the way it worked. So we have these instincts. And instincts are very strong. But now we live in a different environment. Now we have to realize that women can come out of the cave and walk around without being snatched and taken off to some other tribe, you see. So we have to change this attitude. But it's not just an attitude like a cultural attitude. It's an instinct. It's a fundamental way of seeing ourselves and seeing each other and forming our relationship. This isn't going to be done quickly because it's not just a matter, again, of changing an attitude or changing our mind. These are at the instinctual level. This is what kept our species alive. And now we have to have an intention to change. That intention will modify our instincts. And it doesn't have to take a thousand years or a hundred thousand years to modify instincts. You can do that probably in, you know, three or four generations. It's not that hard to do or that impossible, but it won't happen unless we see it, understand it, and start to work on it, you know, start to start to live it. So that's an important uh, point that uh, it's very true. So it's a, it's going to be a new way that men and living, men and women live with each other now than it was a hundred thousand years ago. So we have to allow women to move into our society and still be women. We have to have women um, you know, join us at the workplace or do whatever it is they want to do and still be women rather than, of course, we welcome them into the workplace as long as they act and dress and think and you know, function as men. And that then is just very confusing for women who have to act and think and dress in ways that are not who they are at the fundamental level. It's very confusing and creates a lot of insecurity. So this is a challenge for us now and one we need to be more aware of, of this changing in our environment, which means that we have to change our instincts. But now in the last Oh, the last 10 or 15 lines of the paragraph uh, here where uh, you talked about if society wishes to assist us, then we would have, you know, caring brothers helping us with the outside world and gentle sisters assisting us, nurturing, you know, of the human tribe. All of the rest of that end of the paragraph could be said as well for men. Now, what uh, Huda gave us was the feminine viewpoint of that. But the masculine viewpoint of that really isn't that different. You see, men have a lot of the same issues. Men also have these instincts, and these instincts don't always serve us very well anymore because they were born of a different environment. Men also are struggling with um, identity and uh, their connection and their relationship with females. So all of that last paragraph, you could write it and uh, just by changing a few words and give it from a male perspective and it would be just as meaningful and just as necessary. So it's not just women that are an issue that is, you know, 
that's a problem of our instincts, it's a male and a female issue, pretty much equally. And both are going to be need to be solved together. Men need to also find their value. You see, man, the warrior who, uh, you know, fought off the other tribes and brought down the big animals with his spear isn't what we're about anymore. That's not what men do anymore. But that's what our instincts set us up to be and to do. So there's a transition for everybody. It's not just that women need to be helped to, to uh, come into a, a, new, a new world with, a, with a, a, a modified set of instincts, but so do men. And we can only do it if we do it together, interacting with each other. So it's not a good idea to focus just on, you know, on the uh, on the the ladies, but also the men. It's a it's a problem of humanity needing to adjust to a very different environment. Men and women alike need to have that society assist them. You know, it's uh, it's something we all have to go through. So again, uh, Huda, it's, uh, it's very well written and uh, a good job. These are some important concepts that uh, we need to deal with. And right now, it's causing a huge amount of dysfunction in our culture and in our society. Women don't know what it means to be women. Men are confused of what it means to be men. We both end up on opposite sides of issues because we, we want the other one to understand us and to, you know, help us be who we feel we need to be inside. And that seems to be a struggle. So we end up with this uh, uh, war between the sexes. And the war between the sexes is a war in which there are no winners. There are only losers in that war. So this is a, a probably the major social thing that we're going to have to, to uh, deal with over the next, I don't know, you know, 10 generations or so it would take to, to get around this, this hump. Unfortunately, uh, parts of our culture tend to make it more difficult, both sides. You know, we have uh, extremists pushing on both ends that make it difficult for the rest of us to meet in the middle. And we'll just have to deal with that and get over it and go on and uh, try to live in a more kinder, gentler world productively and optimally. Um, yeah, the old, uh, the old models don't really work for either of us anymore, males or females. So we need that. Good, I, uh, you know, good, good thing, Huda. Appreciate you coming and uh, offering these things to us today. Yes, thank you, Huda. The next up will be Eric. Okay, Eric, you've got a couple of questions. Please go ahead. So uh, my first question kind of relates to the question uh, Huda asked before, as Tom already mentioned. So um, during the last fireside chat, you explained that complete nothingness probably never existed in the sense that before the beginning of existence, there has always been, at the very least, a potential for something to come into existence. You also explained that the larger consciousness system likely arose out of that stateless state of pure potential. This makes sense. And what I wanted to do is relate this back to another question that I asked uh, during the same Fourier chat about the absolute, which is described in different spiritual traditions as the highest perspective we can have on what we are. Interestingly enough, this per perspective is often called pure potential. It is said to stand even before consciousness and seems to share many similarities with this potential that you talked about. My question is, could it be that awakening to this highest perspective on what we really are means coming to the realization that what we really are at the root of our being is this pure potential out of which larger consciousness system arose? It would seem to make sense since if consciousness arose out of this pure potential, as you described, then what we really are at the root of our being must be this pure potential that consciousness arose out of. 
Could it be that in the same way that we can awaken to the perspective of the IUOC or to the perspective of the larger consciousness system, we can awaken to this perspective that is even prior to the larger consciousness system? Yes. I guess uh, there's about four questions there, and I think it's yes, 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 and yes for uh, all four of them. Could it be that the awakening to this highest perspective on what we really are means coming to the realization that what we really are at the root of our being is that pure potential out of which the LCS arose? Yes, indeed, that is the case. We are, before anything else, potential, and free will gives that potential a voice. So um, one of the, one of the um, examples of this is the answer to the question, where does the fear come from? Why, you know, why do we have all this fear? People, um, uh, you know, I mentioned that people make probably 80, 90% of their choices based on their fear. And their fear, of course, creating the ego and creating belief. So why why all this fear? Where does it come from? Why are we so fearful that we're up to our eyebrows in it and it dominates our life? The reason is when we were in the big chat room, if you will remember that metaphor, that uh, before we had this, this, uh, this world to play in, this virtual reality to play in, it was like we were in a big chat room. All we did was exchange information. There was no consequences. There were no consequences. There was really very little traction. Little, it was hard to grow up in that situation. There were very few moral decisions. You could kind of say anything to anybody. You could turn anybody on or off in the data stream, and uh, it just kind of existed. Then we got put into this virtual reality. Then we logged on to this world that it evolved to the point where there were avatars that made decisions that were of a type that were real good for IUOCs to, you know, to log on to and make those choices. So there were interesting choices to the IUOCs. And once we got here, it was another different, you know, it's just a different story altogether. We had to worry about shelter. We had to worry about starvation. We had to worry about, you know, somebody uh, killing us to take the things that we had found, to take our tools or to take our food or whatever. It was suddenly this place where everything had ramifications. Everything had consequences. And the consequences were dire. Because when that free will awareness unit uh, engages, logs on, if you will, to that avatar, it does so in a totally immersive way to where all of its all of its data is just the data from that avatar. So naturally it begins to see itself as that avatar. So it saw itself as the avatar. Now survival was really up close and personal. It wasn't one of these things in a big chat room where we just change data anymore. You know, we were going to get eaten by the tiger. We were going to get killed by our neighbor. We were going to starve to death. Our family, our children were going to starve to death. All of that is where the fear came from. You see, the fear was a potential in the individuated unit of consciousness that was part of its potential. It had the potential to be fearful. It had the potential to be love. It fundamentally isn't anything other than this potential. And though many, many years in the chat room, none of that had ever been triggered, you see. None of those choices ever came about. And then suddenly when they did, we, we uh, took that potential and it was fearful. That's why we have so much fear is because this place creates that because life was so hard and so difficult and we're still you know trying to work out of that fundamental self-centeredness that you get when survival is your main interest in life so it's because we are potential that that happened you see so that's yes that is the fundamental thing that we are we have the potential to be grand and we have the potential to be awful and depending on the circumstances that we react to, 
we can go either way. And when we had these harsh circumstances here, well, they gave us a lot of choices that we never had before. And a lot of those choices were pretty horrific. And we developed fear. We developed self-centeredness. We developed it's all about us trying to survive. And we're still struggling with that now. But there isn't any other way, you see, that this could have been done to make a virtual reality where there is traction on choice, where there is uh, consequences has to be like this. If the consequences were all superficial, then the learning would all be superficial. So in order to make a real uh, entropy reduction trainer with non-superficial consequences, our potential expressed itself as fear. And our job now is to outgrow that. So yes, that's a that's a very good point. We are that potential at the base more than more than anything else. Okay, thank you for that. Um, do you want me to ask my next question, Donna? Okay. Uh, so my next question is: uh, Will the larger consciousness system at some point start to regress back to zero? Uh, the Hindu scriptures say that there are cycles to existence. Ex existence kind of ebbs and flows like the tides, so to speak. They say that there are periods of expansion and periods of contraction, one following the other. At the end of a cycle, existence almost completely contracts into pure potentiality, where it rests in potentiality before expanding again. Are the Hindu scriptures right? Is it possible that the larger consciousness system will continue to grow forever? Or is there going to be a point from where it all regresses back to zero, to a state of pure potentiality? Well, uh, when you ask the question, is it possible um, that the LCS will continue to grow forever? Or is it possible that the Hindus were right? Then yes, it's possible. There isn't any logic that makes that impossible. Uh, but being possible is a far different thing than being likely. I suspect that when the Hindus came to these conclu conclusions, they, they did not have a good working concept of either evolution as a fundamental process or of entropy as a fundamental process. The reason that it's, I think, probably unlikely, though possible, is that evolution is open-ended. Evolution doesn't have an endpoint. Evolution just keeps changing. As long as there are ways to change, it keeps changing. The only thing that can stop evolution is if there aren't any other new states to grow into that are functional. Well, when you have billions and billions and billions of individuated units of consciousness all interacting. There are so many possibilities of what can, what can happen with that. You know, it is such a huge thing that I think it's unlikely to get to a point where there are no, you know, further states to expand into. Now, when we put our own imagination uh, to the task of understanding what those changes could be like, we're going to fall short. We're going to say, well, what could those changes be? And we try to imagine, you know, what it would be like and, and where you might uh, get asymptotic on that curve to where there wasn't much growth anymore. But that's us from our little tiny perspective trying to see what something as grand and that magnificent and, and uh, fantastic as this larger conscious system, you know, where it could possibly get stuck. And I would say that we are woefully incompetent, you know, to make that make that choice. So I would say that looking at the probability is that evolution just doesn't quit. It just keeps on going. I don't see any reason why it should top out. There, there, um, you know, the, the system is limited. It's not an infinite system, so it has finite resources. There's some limitations there. But the, the next uh, concept with entropy and kind of answers that, and that is that 
entropy is a sort of thing that if you don't keep putting effort into it to keep it low, entropy starts to grow all by itself. That's just the nature of entropy. If you don't do maintenance on your house, your house will eventually fall down. You know, if you don't keep putting in energy, putting in effort, then you will backslide and your entropy will increase. Your ego will grow. Your fear will start to develop. So there isn't any end to it in that sense. We won't get to a point where we're perfect and now all we will do is sit around and congratulate each other on being perfect. Because if we do that, we will immediately start to de-evolve and won't be perfect any longer. You see, we have to constantly be working on, on lowering the entropy. So the system can never actually get to this zero entropy where it just stays there stably. It has to continue to work on it. And we haven't even begun to work on the possibilities yet. All right, we have, let's say that in the next you know, millennia, we do find that all of humanity on this planet are all uh, beings of love and we have all evolved to the point that we care about other and that's the way this planet is, you know, the humans on this planet anyway, then that would bring us to, well, what about other reality frames? There's other reality frames chugging along besides ours. Perhaps all the reality frames need to become caring and cooperative with each other. Or if you want to go the, the uh, stay within this, um, this uh, virtual reality, you could say that, well, there will be other planets and other other uh, galaxies and so on, and we will have to learn to become one with them as well. You see, well, where does it stop? You see, you can't even imagine how many layers this could have to where we continue to expand and connect and care about and become one with, with other players, other players in the non-physical, other players in the physical. So I just don't see that that is a, a likely problem, though there is no reason why that couldn't happen. And in my books, I have a little section where I do some, uh, some hand-waving um, conjecture about what we, you know, what we could be. And in there, I say, well, maybe we get to a point where our growth is asymptotic and we upload to something bigger than us all of the progress that we've made and then reset, hit the reset button and start over which is sort of what these, these, uh, the Hindus are saying. That's a possibility, but I just offer that out as conjecture. You know, that's not something that I would say sounds real likely or reasonable. I also said that we may be a single cell in a much larger Ahomasaurus. And that too was just conjecture and, uh, you know, lighthearted and having some fun. Because when it gets to these kinds of questions, you can't come up with, fixed answers. You can't say, oh, well, here's the answer and that's the truth. It's just impossible. We're not that smart. We don't have that big a view. Um, but I look at it just functionally and say, because entropy never goes to zero, because if it does, it will immediately back up and not be zero again. It's the nature of entropy. It doesn't stay, it, it doesn't stay there. There's constant effort has to be put in to keep lowering it. So you never get to zero entropy, just like you never get to zero temperature because the very act of measuring the zero temperature raises the temperature above zero. So it's a similar thing here. So possibly yes, but it doesn't seem likely at all. I can't imagine that it will actually be that way. I don't see any point in it. It doesn't seem to be part of a accumulation of wisdom and growth and caring if you are going to get to a point hit the reset button and start over now it seems more of a um you know more like a a machine that has no point you know it only has a temporary point and then you reset you know and then another you do that again and again and then there's no end to that which seems kind of pointless to me so typically when logical arguments take you to uh, you know, regressions of infinite series or pointless things, then I tend to think that they're not logical. They're not really rational. And I put my money on 
that it won't go that way because things that are evolving, things that are and are being do have a point where we wouldn't be here. It's the same argument about determinism. Determinism is a possibility. It's not, you can't logically show that it's impossible. You can only show that it doesn't make any sense. It's not rational. If you had determinism, there would be no choice. If there's no choice, there'd be no growth. If there's no growth, there's no evolution. So what is there? There's nothing. Everything just is and stays that way, period. That's determinism. What's the point? There is no point. You see, it doesn't go anywhere. It's a dead end. It's uh, possible, but it doesn't make any sense. It's not a, it's not a game that can be played. It's, it's, a, it's a game that's already over before you start to play it. And that is just uh, a, uh, I don't know, kind of a, a ridiculous situation. So I, I don't hold much credit toward ideas that don't go anywhere, that don't have any purpose or point. Because we know that things without purpose and point tend to self-destruct and go away. That's the nature of, of our reality. Things that, that persist do have purpose and point. Okay. Uh, yeah, great. That was very interesting. Uh, okay, so my last question is about memory. Uh, if the brain doesn't store any information, then where is, that, where is it that our memories are stored? If the answer to this is the past actualized database, then why has human memory been shown to be so fallible and unreliable? Okay. Uh, our memories are stored in consciousness. Okay. Our, uh, our virtual brain is just a computed thing. And it's not even computed until somebody cuts your skull open. And then it's computed as part of the virtual reality. As long as your skull is shut, no brain is ever computed. It's never in anybody's data stream. It's just assumed to be in there, but it's not part of the, it's not actually part of the computed reality. So all of that uh, analytical thinking, our assessing, our um, uh, learning and growing, the memories, it's all stored in consciousness, not in, in brains. Okay. So, it's not necessarily uh, uh, follows, though, that the storage is the past actualized database. That's something else altogether. That's all the things that, that uh, could have happened but didn't, and the probability that they might have. That's too much. You don't need all of that for an individuated unit of consciousness to function. That's overkill. So I would think it would just be a memory that's local to that individuated unit of consciousness. That's the memory. And the reason it's so fallible and unreliable is that it starts new with every free will awareness unit logging on. That free will awareness unit does not take any of the memory, any of the intellectual property of the IUOC. All it takes is the quality of that IUOC. It takes that quality and becomes totally immersed in a, with an avatar. It begins to believe it is that avatar, and all of its experience is the experience of that avatar, the experience of what of the avatar's senses, if you will. That's all of its data stream has to be in terms of the avatar. So that memory, which is the memory of the free will awareness unit is only what it's seen and heard and felt since it's been aware in the virtual reality. And that's very fallible because very seldom do we have enough information to actually come to deductive conclusions about anything. So we fill in with our ego and our beliefs and our fears and jump to conclusions about the way things are. And that's why that, that memory and our actions are kind of all over the place. So the memory is limited to just the experience that the free will awareness unit has with the avatar. And that's it. Well, that's a very limited set. And it's fallible because it is so limited.